Well, good afternoon. This is our third COVID-19 weekly update. We're coming a little earlier this week. I know it's only Tuesday and normally we do this on Friday. That's kind of how rapidly things seem to be changing. Right now, life in church is a real challenge. Perception and reality of things can be so individualized. Opinions are very personal. Science projections don't all agree. Politics is very divisive. And the value of faith varies from non-existent and unimportant in some people to most important and preeminent in others. Mandates are constantly changing and essential services are challenging to understand. In my lifetime, our society has not faced this set of circumstances, nor has it during my time in the church. A few have criticized us at New Hope the last 48 hours, and I hope I've lived out James chapter 1, verse 19. Let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I want those who've criticized to know I've listened, I've heard you. And even though we had already announced this past Sunday that we were making more changes to how we live out being the church in our community during these unusual times, we've gone even further after listening. I will share those changes in a few minutes. I am unsure what I'm about to do is going to help with any understanding, but all I can do is try and hope and pray. First, let me clarify that over the past few weeks, it has not been business or church as usual. Usual would have been doing weddings instead of canceling weddings and having to console brides. Usual would have been helping family plan celebration of life to bring about some healing and comfort and closure to the death and loss of loved ones and friends. Instead, what we're having to do is help them navigate through setbacks, delays, postponements, very limited attendees at services and intensified grief and a mountain full of frustration. Usual would have been having 600 to 1,000 in church over these next few weeks rather than experiencing less than 50 in each of our services over the last two weeks. Our last few weeks, we've had less than 10% in a service compared to our average weekly Sunday. In almost every email that we've sent out these last three weeks and in every live update, we have posted our encouragement for the choice to stay home. And we've stressed several things that the government has asked us to stress is important. Whatever you choose during this time, we should all follow these recommendations. Cover your cough. Wash your hands frequently and thoroughly. Try not to touch your face. If you were sick or having to weaken the immune system, by all means, stay home. Guard your space. Sanitize surfaces often. Get a flu shot. And we even added an extra one for church. Don't shake hands for a while, just nod and wave. We have not had children's Sunday school. Our teenagers have not been meeting on campus. They've been using Zoom. We've provided sanitary hand stations at each entrance with ushers reminding everyone to use it as they entered. We reminded attendees about proper spacing. We averaged two to a pew. We sanitize before each service and after each service. We've conscientiously worked at keeping the spirit of the mandates. We've spoken with locally elected officials, with law enforcement, and even this past Sunday after a complaint, we had a visit with the health department. We explained the what and the how and the why of what we're doing, and we were told it was acceptable. Our intent has not been defiance. Our intent right now is not for the majority of our congregation or our community to attend New Hope Church. We have rapidly purchased what it takes to do live streaming in order to connect our stay-at-home community. Our desire on Sunday mornings was and is to be available to the scared, the vulnerable, the confused, the discouraged, those who are struggling in isolation and experience a growing fear. It is often in calamity and crisis that people realize they have a need for God. And for all those who feel alone and disenfranchised, an open door at a church, I believe, is an essential service. Not everyone has the technology to stay connected, and there are some people at certain times when what they need is a God with skin on. Let me see if I can explain what I mean by that. I read a story several years ago of a mom who took her six-year-old daughter up and tucked her into bed. And after they said their prayers together, the mother got up to leave, and as she got to the door and turned out the light, her daughter said, Mom, could you stay with me? It's dark, and I'm afraid. 
And the mother went back to the bedside and whispered to her daughter, darling, you never have to be afraid. You are never alone. God is always with you. And as the mom started to leave the room again, the little girl whispered loud enough for her mother to hear, but mom, sometimes I need a God with skin on. And I believe that's who the church is supposed to be. Jesus tells us that when we become a Christian, he comes to live within us and express himself through us. The scripture says that Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus said, don't hide our light under a bushel. Don't hide those who need me. That's what we've been trying to do. Not carelessly, but cautiously. Just as restaurants and florists and construction crews and other businesses have been trying to observe the mandates and at the same time they've been trying to find ways to function in this climate for their survival. We as a church are trying to find ways to function not for the survival of the church, that's God's responsibility, but trying to be God's church to be available for the survival of others. That's been our desire. The messages over the last two weeks, whether they were found online or live streaming or by the few who showed up, to the services were designed to give hope. One was about the value of Christ being in us and with us as we live in uncertain times. And when we have that assurance, we can be assured that we're not alone, that we will not be abandoned, and as, as, as a result of Christ's presence, we don't have to be afraid. This last week, we matched the scripture with a wrestling analogy and discovered that when life takes us down, we have three options. We could quit, we can escape, or we can be ready for the opportunity for a reversal, a turnaround in things. Each week, in the few who were present, there were individuals who had shown up I had never seen before. One of the gentlemen walked up to me and he said, I'm an addict. I've been clean for a while. I don't want to relapse. I can't find an AA or a CR that's open. I needed to be here. This made a difference. Another person came up and said with tears in their eyes, the grocery store is where I go to get food for my body. This is where I come to get food for my soul. It keeps me thinking right and feeling healthy. The second challenge we face as leaders in a church to make rapid decisions that balance government mandates and God-centered principles is how do we deal with the extremely mixed signals that come from others, oftentimes strangers who want to impose their will upon us. Let, let me show you two Facebook posts that I've received over the last two weeks. One of them is this one, and I don't know if you can read it on there, so let, let me read it to you. It said, coronavirus got churches canceling services this weekend. Damn, what happened to weapons formed against me shall prosper. This is one person who presses not, professes not to believe in God, and yet he quotes scripture and his... His inference is that we are closing churches because of fear. The other one that uh, we received was this one, and it came from a person who said, I'm stunned you continue to endanger the public by not canceling services. I would never trust a church that actively fights against the best scientists of the day. I don't care if you all want to stay together and infect each other and self-rapture, but what about the health of community? Again, quoting scripture and we have the opposite indication, the opposite indication that if you don't close, we're not going to be happy. So two extreme views, and there's no way we can possibly satisfy them both. I have to be honest, I'm a person who likes to please people. I've tried to spend most of my ministry finding a way to convey the truth of God in a way that tells the truth, but also invites them in. I hate to make people unhappy. I don't enjoy making people uncomfortable. And yet, the scripture also says that we ought to be pleasers of God. And so I have to balance that in the decisions that I make. In my life as a Christian and a pastor, I've tried to find the balance of three things in decision making. Knowledge, wisdom, and faith. Knowledge is the acquisition of facts and truth went to college to learn as much as I could. I, I love to read, probably read five or six books a week. Uh, my phone explodes with things that I try to keep up with. But knowledge by itself is not satisfactory. 
What we also need is wisdom. The difference between knowledge and wisdom is that wisdom is putting the knowledge we have to its best use and application in the way in which we make decisions. And the third thing, and it's important to me because I am a Christian. I'm a Christian not because I've been good enough to earn it or given enough money to buy it. I'm a Christian by the grace of God who said, you can't earn it, you can't buy it, and you can't be good enough to deserve it, but I love you so much, I'll give it to you as a gift. But we receive that gift by faith. And faith is the recognition that by myself, I'm not an all-knowing person. I don't possess all wisdom like God. But rather, I admit that I'm not God. And by faith, I can trust in the one who is God. And with a growing knowledge of who he is and a growing knowledge of who he's about, what he's about from his word, he will provide for us wisdom to rightly apply the truths in life. Some through the years choose to believe that Christians don't care much about education or knowledge or higher learning, that we're just ignorant people who need a crutch. What many don't realize, or maybe they've chosen to forget, is that most of our our early universities, the Ivy League schools like Harvard and Princeton and Yale, those were all started by pastors and churches. You see, they believed then that the more people could learn about creation and people who inhabit this world, science and biology, the more that we could learn about our Creator and we could better understand His writings, the Bible. And the more that we could learn about God and the more we could live in dependence upon Him who created us, the better we would be. Unfortunately, over the decades and now centuries, what has happened is the more that man has learned about him or herself, the more proud of ourselves we become, the more self-sufficient we are, and the more independent from God we have become. We've gotten to a place that a lot of people believe the lie that the devil told Eve in the garden, that with the knowledge of good and evil, we can become like God. I readily admit I'm not God, but Jesus Christ is God, and he loves us so much that he's given himself to us that we can have a relationship with him. The scripture says he lives in us. So that as we make day-to-day -day decisions, we can pray and study the scriptures and seek his wisdom and figure out how to rightly apply the knowledge and the facts along with the wisdom and the truth of scripture. I deeply desire every day to depend upon Christ, to follow his leadership in these very rapidly changing circumstances. And I would love for all of you to pray for us. We're doing our best to pray for you. If you disagree with us in the direction we've gone, please pray for us. If you agree with us, please, please pray for us. If you're unsure what to believe in these days, pray. We desire God's best during these worst times. Now let me share with you the changes we've made since we've been listening and praying and seeking wisdom. For the next several weeks, the Sunday morning service will be available on Facebook through live stream only at 9 a.m. You do not need to have a personal Facebook account to watch the service there. An email will be sent out to explain how that works. If you don't get the email by Thursday, please contact the office and we'll walk you through it. Immediately after the live stream service at 9 o'clock, this will be posted so that you can watch it at your own convenience, either on Facebook or on YouTube. Easter Sunday... Though we're not having the normal choir presentation that we normally do, that's being postponed till a later date, we do have something very special for you. Tim Kepler, one of our worship leaders, is going to be sharing a five-song Easter-focused concert of praise and worship. And you all know Tim Kepler can knock it out of the park. That concert will be followed by the Easter message. We will not be doing drive-in church as we mentioned last Sunday. This will simply be live streamed at 9 o'clock Easter Sunday morning. Communion will be available immediately following that service in a drive through fashion in the parking lot between 10 and noon. If you want to come and receive communion, just drive into the parking lot. There will be tables sectioned out. You can drive right by a table. Someone will be there. You can pick up your own shrink-wrapped communion cup 
and wafer and take it with you in your car. Someone will briefly pray with you as you drive through. And so if you would like to share communion, please come by between 10 and noon on Easter Sunday. Though there'll be no gatherings of any kind on Sunday mornings for the next several weeks, I and a few members of our ministry staff who want to be there, we will be present in the sanctuary from 9 to noon to pray with anybody who may be in need of personal prayer and connection. Somebody who, as a result of this crisis, is just looking for somewhere to find peace will be present for those who show up. No services. We will cover all the hygiene things that are necessary, washing stations, sterilization, keeping distance, but there will be somebody there. They won't find a closed door. Our three Zoom Bible studies, which we're using Chip Ingram's book, The Real God, started today uh, at 10 a.m. We're offering it every Tuesday at 10 a.m. in the morning, every Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m., and every Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m. You should have received an email from us and already indicated uh, which time that you wanted to attend. Uh, this week it's a trial run and an introduction and next week we'll engage in chapter one. If all the time slots get filled, then we'll try adding another date and time to accommodate the demand for this Bible study. It looks at the character of God, the character of God that changes not, something we need to be very familiar with during these rapidly changing times. Let me change gears as I wrap things up for today. Several have asked if I would repeat the three movie recommendations I made at the end of the Sunday services. These are something for you to do at home while you seem to have a lot of time on your hands. Three really good movies that Shelley and I watched last week. One is entitled Beautifully Broken. Another member of our church recommended it to us and we watched it, we loved it. This is a movie about a refugee's escape a prisoner's promise, and a daughter's painful secret, and how they all converge together, causing their lives to become intertwined in the ways they could never imagine from two different continents, the United States and Rwanda. Three fathers fight to save their families, and they are led on an unlikely journey across the globe where they learn the healing power of forgiveness and reconciliation. Two words I think that are important for us today. And this is a true story. Another movie that I watched that I think the guys will really like, it's called Seven Days in Utopia. Uh, this involves golf and fishing. Um, and let's see, what else is it about? It's golf and fishing and faith. After a disastrous debut on the pro circuit, a young golfer, played by Lucas Black, finds himself unexpectedly stranded in Utopia, Texas. And he's welcomed there by an eccentric rancher who is played by Robert Duvall. Fascinating story, filled with faith. And the last one is called I Still Believe. This is the story of recording artist Jeremy Camp. This is a recent release in the theater, and because of all that's gone on, that release had to be limited, so they have released it on Amazon. This one will cost you a little bit. I believe it was $19.95 for 48 hours. So this is one when the family's together, but it's certainly worth the price. May I leave you with these words? It's the last message that Jesus really shared with his closest friends. It actually probably took place about a week from now. It's the first day or two of Easter week. Jesus was about to be betrayed and arrested and abused and crucified and he would die. And Jesus' words to his closest friends were these. Do not let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. This world might take your life, but I've got eternal life for you. And he says, I'm the way. I'll provide direction for you. I'm the truth. I'll give you wisdom. And I am the life. I'm the way to the truth. I'm the truth about the life. And life wins out. So in the midst of all that's going on, let's hear the words of Christ. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Enjoy the movies. Pray for us. Pray for one another. Stay in the Word and be kind. Thank you. God bless you.